Welcome to the 70th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today, we are covering the eighth week of the fall 2018 anime season. As always, we include timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and the podcast feed if you only want to hear about one or two shows that we're covering, since we spoil literally everything. My name is Bcom, and I am so inspired by Run With The Wind that I have started a strict training regimen. That I, it will surely kill me in the next three days. <laughs> Haiji would be proud. <laughs> also with me are Kat and Leo. Oh, I can't wait to talk hey. about how ridiculous that show gets. <laughs> I agree with you. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Man. So what nonsense did you guys get up to this week? Anybody uh, feel free to jump in. Leo, I like your story. So, yeah. I mean, if people don't know, I read a ton. So a little while back, I read a book called The Dirty by Motley Crue. It's basically their biography. And it's so disgusting and disturbing, the things they did. Oh, and just the sheer amount of drugs is like, I at times you honestly just can't believe it. Uh, but like, this is early on in the book, and this is mild on the scale of how debaucherous they got one thing they did early on was live in just like a trash of a house that they would use like their hairspray as flamethrowers to scorch the roaches off the walls <laughs> uh, the drummer would <laughs> use their amps and boxes as walls to try to keep the roaches from crawling over his face as he slept <gasps> nice it's very so nice fascinating the, the, and this is like from a scale to one to ten uh, ten being like the worst things that happened in this book this is like two or three Oh this is God. nothing. Well, it's, I mean, if you if you've heard some of their songs, like they got some questionable songs. Like she's <laughs> only fifteen. <laughs> like she's yeah. Oh, like I yeah. mean, I forgot. But there's, there's some questionable there's a stuff. Story be- why that one was written like that and stuff like that. But like, oh, I'm sure there is. <laughs> I'm sure. It's, it's a wonder they even stayed together, and it's a wonder any of them are alive. Uh, even though I think all of them died multiple times at one point from drug overdoses and shit. But <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure they, they, they virtually died and yeah, then so came back to life. They had been trying to get a movie made for it for like a while. And they uh-huh. apparently got to do it with Netflix. And uh, cool. Oh, darn, I can't remember their lead singer's name right now. Oh, God. But he's he's been like working with them. And what he's so stoked about is that like Netflix isn't censoring everything, anything. So like... All this messed up stuff that's in the book is going to be on this mo- in this movie, and it comes out March twenty second, two thousand nineteen. And I am so pumped! It is. It was such a good read. I that, think the that, this lead movie is Vince insane. Neil. Yes, Pretty Vince sure. Neil. So wait, <clears throat> was this called the Dirt or the Dirty? I think you said Dirty before. The Dirt, right? The, the dirty. dirty. The Dirt. Oh, the Dirt. Oh, the Dirt. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. The yeah. Dirty would have been better. Damn. <laughs> well, but speaking of drugs, I have just been. <laughs> Like, doing a lot of legal drugs this week is, like, I'm still sick as fuck. And, like, when you have asthma and you're sick as fuck and you have been for a month, you get to go in and, like, do this, this like, thing that looks like a vape pen. And it, like, has medicine in it. And it just makes you, like, really amped and, like, kind of high. And it, like, it also makes you your lungs better. But, like, it, it takes you places <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> I'm excited to wear, see where those places are in this podcast. Yeah. Cat, Cat's going to be part of the girls in Twilight. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but you watched the movie, didn't you, Become? Yeah, last night I went to see the movie Mirai in theaters. Uh, this is the Mamoru Hosoda movie, like who made, you know, Wolf Children, Girl Who Left Through Time, Summer Wars, all that stuff, Boy and the Beast. And uh, so this is his latest movie, and my theater experience for this movie was really bad. Uh, I went to a different closer theater than the one I usually go to and so like the first theater I sit in I sit there for 20 minutes the screen just doesn't start then they come in they're like there was a malfunction we're gonna move you to another theater so like after 20 minutes we all walk over to this other theater and then when the movie finally starts playing it's in English instead of Japanese with English subtitles like it was supposed to be and like gasp some people started complaining and then they were like all right we can't change it and then so this japanese woman who was there with like her daughter like left because she came to see a japanese like spoken movie right and yeah (laughs) i I hope i hope she wrangled a fucking manager on her way out and at least got her money back i I hope so i really hope so i didn't i didn't follow her or anything to see if that happened but yeah uh and then so i watched the movie in english uh i really did not like it um 
though it did just get nominated for a Golden Globe Award, apparently. So apparently I'm wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I just, I did not enjoy watching this family because they are like a modern family and they have a newborn baby girl and they have a four-year-old toddler boy named Kuhn who the is like the center focus of the movie and he really does not like losing the attention of his parents when the new baby like a newborn baby girl is born and he's like a total like terror like he's just constantly yelling and screaming for his mom and complaining for like an hour and a half of this freaking movie and i was just like oh this is a great movie if you like want to convince people not to have kids like <laughs> wow. so, so it's birth control in a movie right, basically that's how i felt about it i i've talked to a lot of people that feel differently but yeah so, oh. so if you've got like like 14 15 year old kids Plop them down, have them watch this. <laughs> you won't, you won't be having problems. That's what you're saying. Maybe, yeah. I also thought it was kind of okay. a critique of uh, millennial parents not having their shit together, uh, because. Oh. Well, I mean, they're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we all don't have our shit together. <laughs> yeah, Let's probably. be real. People our age kind of suck at that shit. Yeah, for sure. But uh. So anyway, it's it's still an interesting watch. I would be interested to see it in Japanese again at some point, but not in English ever again, probably. So yeah, but yeah, yeah that was that's my a bummer. Do you ever wonder how like people, how so many people have had kids over the years? <laughs> like, how do they all do it? They have sex, cat. <laughs> that's how they do. Well, it. But like, like how do they not murder their children like in their oh. crib? Well, that's true. <laughs> like once they have them, that's a good point. Because I mean, it's so stressful. It Jesus. is really stressful. There is a lot of you know, heavy all parental instinct, though, going on. All y'all that have kids out there and you haven't murdered them in their cribs, like, take your hand and just pat yourself on the back there yep. for a second. Good job. Man. Just just feel good about yourself. Cat, if you have any of those drugs left over when you're not sick anymore, I will gladly take them off your hands. Oh. All right. Oh. Since Cat is clearly in Twilight, let's talk about the girl in Twilight. <laughs> Episode 8, yes. As- Asuka and Asuka. Uh, so at the beginning of this episode, the girl's local cafe, Cafe Octave, is super busy because that pretty boy, Toymoya, has a new musical that's showing nearby about getting married to a girl named Nana, which was kind of funny because, like, Nana, like, kind of got thrown off at the beginning there because, uh, like, she thought it was about her for a second. And then Asuka decides, like, they're going to go help out the old cafe owner who fell and is having a hard time getting around. Uh, I actually skipped over some stuff here, Leo, like that you liked about um, like Chloe thinking she might want to take up programming and stuff like yeah. that. It was it was kind of cool because like the girls were learning from their Twilight selves, like experiences like Chloe wanted to do take up programming this doing instead of doing like the liberal arts or whatever. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then. Uh, and then like what's going through like a. Uh, uh, use head like she's uh like the erotic you is like having an effect on her she's yeah. kind of thinking maybe she should unwind a little bit and not be so uptight and it, it i just there, there were just these little things and it's just interesting to see them you know grow up and evolve the way they are i just thought it was cool yeah they've been changing because of all these like escapades they've been through basically yeah, it's just a sign of you know good writing i yeah. think <laughs> Yeah, I do agree with that. I also was kind of like, how are they just helping this cafe owner and not getting paid? Because I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's not that's at all point. legal, and that would be child slavery. He he like um, like yeah, that's not clear early on, but then like towards the end, like he paid them. <laughs> so oh, did he? I didn't even does, I didn't does he? Because I, I missed that. Because I was like, wait, I was like, is, are they doing this for free? But that's just like the finance I think side it was of like going, some th- No, yeah. <laughs> It was some like throwaway line of them getting paid. Like it's like a blink and you miss type thing. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Asuka, okay. Asuka gets like really into it. Like um, they, they, all the girls wear like pink ab- uh, aprons on the first day. And then she's like, we're going to do, we're going to wear outfits the next time. So like day two, they wear like made outfits. And then Asuka's like, well, that was kind of cliche. So let's just do a different theme every day. And then so they start like, recycling all of the outfits they've used in the other worlds like they start wearing <laughs> bridesmaids outfits or, or what, brides outfits um, 
bride gowns and then like cowgirl outfits on day four. And then when it gets to day five, everybody's busy except for you and Asuka. And Asuka's like, well, I guess we need to wear bathing suits like we did in Chloe's <laughs> arc. And Yu's like, that would be really creepy. <laughs> Yeah, but the, Asaka, not, not Asuka, the other stuff. Asuka just has that. a line That's the only that thing. says, "What's creepy about using our healthy bodies to attract younger customers?" <laughs> <laughs> Laugh my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you're only attracting younger customers? <laughs> Pretty oh, sure you're boy. attracting all ages. Good point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Never so, seen so many old men in this cafe before. <laughs> exactly. So like you gets a call from her dad who scolds her for skipping cram school to like help out. And so she has to rain check because she listens to her dad. And so Asuka is all alone and helping out until she finds that Sirius Ka, who I'm just gonna call Sirius Ka. I'm I'm retiring Twilight Asuka because this seems to be her official nickname now. Um She's at the cafe, and Asuka's like, oh, yes, I get to dress you up in a maid outfit now. Um, and says, I just like, want to point out for a second <laughs> yeah. that I was calling her Serious Ka before I know. any y'all <laughs> called her Serious Ka. This is true. Oh. Good job. Sorry. Anyway, go on. Uh, and so, like, yeah, <laughs> like, Asuka, like, the normal one, like, whispers in her ear, like, this is payback for all the miso you've been enjoying from my family shop. Um, and it's like I, yep. there was this one funny moment where Asuka trips and falls like this platter of two coffee cups and Sirius kind of like you know athletically grabs the cups off the tray like as it's falling and then like as Asuka falls the show does another one of those like just weird it just does it I don't know why <laughs> out of nowhere upskirts that's just like why is this even here and it, it just, it's such a graceful like it was a very graceful slow upskirt, motion yes. <laughs> upskirt. I, I was fascinated yeah they spent a yeah. lot of time animating that like flap of the skirt you know like they really got it you know <laughs> <laughs> oh man so this and like her eyes widening as she sees the upskirt oh yeah absolutely oh. like someone should make a meme of that where there's just like a it's going down for real like in the background <laughs> as her eyes like widen <laughs> for sure oh man so this kid comes into the cafe his nickname is takun and sirius Ka clearly recognizes him from her own fragment and tells Asuka that she knows him well, and we'll find out why later. Uh, the other girls show up, and they start talking about how much nicer and sexier, like, Sirius Ka looks, because she's, like, refined and mature. Uh, they also well, try to... Oh, what? Well, first they keep mistaking her for, uh, like, re regular Asuka, and they keep saying things like, oh, you seem so much more confined now and stuff like that and i fucking yeah. cracked up every time they walked in and said something because <laughs> then like asuka's like hiding behind the bar she's like really guys really <laughs> all except for you who they try to like trick but she like mm -hmm. immediately realizes it's serious from like one yep. glance they also say something about how asuka is cute too uh and like they they translate it but like what the japanese said is like cause she's got like that gap moe appeal <laughs> <laughs> she's not completely put together so uh mm -hmm. asuka sneaks sirius into her house that night so she can like, take a bath and have some dinner thinking that nobody is home but it turns out her grandma's there and she sees both of them right next to each other and so like sirius is quick on her feet she like makes up a story that they randomly met and became friends because they looked identical and they have the same name and yeah she tells her grandma her last name is siri get it <laughs> You're right Yes. Siri Asuka. Siri Asuka. <laughs> so she ends up eating dinner with the fam. And uh, Asuka's father actually gets kind of testy when Asuka wants like, to go with him to like his union meeting, basically. Mm -hmm. And... Like she's like, you know, I'm I'm gonna like take over the business one day, and she she tells him like I wrote miso maker on my career planning form and everything, like because he asks her if she did, and he basically tells her like you should think that over because you're totally not ready, and she's pissed, and but like he's pretty stern about it, and there's some tension there that, yeah, that you see for sure, yeah, uh, and she's bummed out, and then like she goes and takes a bath with Sirius Ka. Uh, which was, like, fairly tasteful, honestly, as far as bath scenes go. I'm not going to, like, complain. Um, yeah, it wasn't that bad at all. Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, Sirius says, like, remember that kid I saw earlier in the cafe, Takun? Like, in my world, he's, like, starving and barely able to survive. And that's, like, how it is for everybody in my world. And so, when I look at you, 
I don't know if you should like tie yourself down to the family business because I want you to be free to do what whatever you want to do. Because like I think Sirius is thinking like at least this Asuka can live a nice, happy life for herself, even if I can't. Um, and so yeah, both Asuka's like then wake up from having this same dream of seeing their little brother Kyo smiling and telling them that he's okay. And they kind of have like a nice moment bonding over it. And then the Walkman starts blaring louder than usual. And Siriska like immediately like gets ready and like has to return to her fragment. And Asuka like follows her, tries to go with her. But Siriska's like, no, I want you to live here where you have a future and just tell all the other girls I had a lot of fun with them. And so she transports away. But Asuka had sneakily written down the frequency on the Walkman. And so she gathers everybody and they all follow Asuka over to the fragment. They actually like debate about it for a second. Like, should we go? And they all decide, yeah, we should go. Um, and they decide to use you as the link uh, since she's the only one who can't like transform right now. And also because Asuka needs to be able to talk to Siriuska and talk this over. And right. so they they arrive in her fragment and yeah. there's like this weird bright dome ominously covering the entire city. And that's like the cliffhanger, basically. It looks very ominous. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle like doing use arc because I'm assuming they're going to try and do use arc at the same time that they deal with basically Asuka's arc and like getting into the meat of the story, which should be Asuka's like brother and whatever's up with that and all of this. So yeah, I don't know how they're going to handle those two things. Well, I think they had to do it at the end because of erotic you also being a factor. Like I'm sure she will be around for whatever the end game of this anime is going to be too. So that's true. Yeah. Like, but yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Cause oh, I was yeah. like, Hmm, they got to almost do this simultaneously. We'll see how that works. Yeah. I'm curious how it's going to play out for sure. Um, any other thoughts on this before we move on? Mm, four more episodes. So see what they can do. We have a lot of sea otters to talk about. So, Kat, why don't you take it away? Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ. Golden Kabooey second season. Oh. Let's go. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so at the very beginning of the episode of... Okay, so we got Golden Kamui. And this episode's called Blue Eyes. Episode 20. You excited? <laughs> you excited about it? Oh, I'm excited so about excited. it. Okay. <laughs> so Inkamar, Inkamat and Ginjiro are still traveling together. And a guy, like a guy, comes up to them on the beach and offers them like the sea otter, and he's like, "Oh, you're a couple, so I'm gonna offer you this." And like I, at first, I, I've always thought that Ikramat kind of like was teasing Genjiro, mm -hmm. but she kind of blushes at this point, yeah. and I'm like, "Oh, okay, she actually does like him." Yeah, the show specifically shows that she's probably has legit feelings for him at this point. So mm -hmm. it, it makes it interesting for what happens later on, but we'll talk about yeah, when we get there for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, in the meantime, like, <laughs> Sukimoto and the gang are in this other area, and there's, like, a bunch of locusts just that just appear, <laughs> like, out of nowhere, and they're just like, oh, shit, and they go inside this lodge. And I guess in the 1800s, locusts were, like, a huge thing. Like, because that's basically when they were... I don't think they are a thing anymore. Like, you never... I mean, locusts definitely still exist, anymore. and you, you can, there's definitely still swarms, like, even today, like, I know, like, in places like Madagascar, I've heard about, like, locust swarms, like, they still exist. Well, but we, we we've gotten rid of them in, like, populated areas, like, uh, North America have. used to have locusts, and we don't have them anymore. It makes mm. me wonder what we did to get rid of them. Because uh, they're, like, so crazy. We, clear, we, we clearly <laughs> prayed to the Bible really hard. <laughs> apparently but yeah so so it does make sense during this time there were a lot of locusts um they're not in a lot of areas of the world anymore i guess there are still some areas but most of the most of the areas of the world they've kind of gone away but at this time period there were a yeah. lot of locust swarms so it makes sense so anyway um poor Inkimon gets stuck like running from the swarm by herself and until she meets up with Asirfa, who's like get in the boat bitch and like she gets to the boat um, and she's like, ha I've got you now because you're caught between this boat and these locusts. And <laughs> there's only one choice for you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So she's like, now I got you in private, and I'm going to ask you all this shit about your father. So meanwhile, Sugimoto and Genjiro and everyone are cooking this Jesus honor meat. Jesus Christ. Because <laughs> so, they're like, well, we're in this hut. There's a bunch of locusts outside, and we got this honor meat. Let's do it. And so they're, like, cooking it. And, like, I think Sugimoto is the one who comments it has an interesting smell. And at first I thought he meant, like, it stinks. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's, like, a sexy smell. (laughs) (laughs) Because Sugimoto is suddenly alarmed that Shiraishi just looks sexy to him. (laughs) And then Patagi's button just, like, comes off. And he says, like, oh, it came off again. Which makes me think this has happened many times. Well, have you seen his chest? It's like, uh, well, he's dying I mean, he to break has a out chest. of there. Uh, and I think that it's hilarious. This whole this whole time this scene is taking place, Ogata is, like, clearly affected. But he's, like, a psychopath. So he just lays on the floor, <laughs> like, blank-faced and sweating. And, and you almost want to hear, like, what's going on in his head. Yeah. Like, is he is he also around? and like troubled by this or is he just like must must fight this urge like i don't know what's going on yeah i don't know (laughs) it's so funny because it just jumps from one guy to the next and they're just like all admiring each other (laughs) it's just like what the fuck is going on i also looked up if seal otter meat did this and i couldn't find shit about it (laughs) yeah well i mean every culture has like some bullshit about something that causes yeah. You know, amorousness. Like, like some people think what uh, oysters do that, and they don't really do that, but people think they do. So, you know, um, I'm sure it's kind of like that. But yeah, ki- then Kir- Kiranke comes in at this point, and they all look sexily at him too. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, the shit, this is going down. Gay orgy in the lodge, y'all. <laughs> like, here we go. Like, um, and it, and then it cuts to a Sirfine Inkermot. And I also, I love how this episode, you've got this, like, weird juxtaposition between, like, basically a gay orgy scene and a very serious discussion of plot. <laughs> like, yeah, just going back and forth. I, I love it. It's it was ridiculous. Yeah, because they both just contrast off each other so well. It makes a serious scene look so much more serious and the fucking insane scene even more insane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. And, and this is Gold Conway in a nutshell. Like, this highlights... What is amazing about Golden Comedy? You get this raunchy, ridiculous bullshit that you love, and you also get like the good plot, like all in one of them, sure. all wrapped in one show. So anyway, Sirpa asks Inkermont if Inkermont hates her father, and Inkermont's like, "I don't. I've always been on your and your father's side." But Sirpa clearly doesn't believe her and thinks Inkermont is lying. Inkermont says the man in prison. No, Parabo isn't her father, and that her father, Wilk, wasn't the kind of man who could kill Ainu and steal their gold. So it becomes clear as she's talking about him, like, this bitch is in love with Osirpa's father. Like, she loves him. Because she's like, when I met your father, he was a new immigrant, and he's half Polish, half Ainu. From this area called, like, Sakhalin? Yeah. Which is kind of like a place where where people like different minorities that are opposing the Tsar, uh, like in Russia, live and kind of fought against the Tsar for their freedom. Um, and so he fought in a war against the Tsar down there. He had some wounds. He came up to Japan, Japan, and like was recovering from his wounds there. And then from what Inkermot tells him about how awesome like the culture is in Japan is like he grows to love it there and decides to stay. Um and Asirpa is really angry at this description because like her father never told her about Inkerma and he always said that he learned all this stuff from her mom. So like the idea that she, he actually learned it from Inkerma is really upsetting to her. And at this point I'm not going to lie. I thought like Inkermot was going to turn to her and have like a Star Wars moment and be like, Asirfa, <laughs> I am your mother. <laughs> didn't you think that for a second? Oh, you, you know what? I didn't think that at the time, but that totally could have happened. I thought it too, because if you remember, they just said uh, Asirfa's mother got sick and died. Have they been lying to her this whole time? <laughs> could be. Exactly. But yeah. but of course, that that's not. I, that would have been like much more of an epic plot twist. But instead, she cries and says, 
I guess to Wilk I was still a child. Maybe he forgot about me. And it's all dramatic, and I'm like, ah, plot plot twist ruined. But anyway, so she says uh, Wilk was murdered by Kyoranke. Da da da. And then they go back to the lodge where Kyoranke is currently like sweating it up <laughs> and being like, ooh, y'all look sexy. <laughs> and. Uh, He's like, yeah, I'm glad I met up with you guys right before this locust swarm went down, cause, cause then I got to see all how y'all sexy, sexy backs look in this uh, firelight or whatever. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, Ogata just continues to look dead inside because he's a psychopath. I just love like the <laughs> his looks throughout this whole thing. Um, and then finally, Sugimoto says he can't take it anymore, and he takes off all his clothes and declares they should. All plays sumo. <laughs> My God. <laughs> and I, okay, I'm not gonna say they had gay sex, but like, there's a very awkward when, scene when they literally crawled out of that fucking place. They still had their whatever you call those underwear belt things on. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but but it, but do we, any of us believe that sumo is all that happened? <laughs> there are a lot of. Body against body, I don't know. <laughs> Some things went down. That was like a bara manga. That was like yeah. <laughs> it was ridiculous. That that really was a bara. Like that that's what it reminded me of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some of the bar I've watched of like uh some sports shows. That's what it reminded me of. Um but yeah, so this orgy may or may or may not have happened. There's like a very awkward little um shot take scene of like them all wrestling sweatily. <laughs> and then they all lay naked, just panting for a while, just soaking in the afterglow of, of whatever occurred. Leave it up to your imagination. Yes. Uh, and then they walk out and say, let's agree to, to uh, act like this never happened. So I'm just saying they have nothing to be embarrassed about. They wouldn't have that exchange. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, and then later, Tanagaki gets woken up by Inkermot, who basically he's like, "I'm gonna go to Bone Town with you tonight." We'll blame it on and the he, seal meat. Blame it on the sea otter. <laughs> yeah, bl- yeah, blame it on the meat, baby. Um, but he, he seems kind of into it. But he has this weird like thing where he looks at his gun for a so, second. And so I'm this, like, he, this, this, I know why. No, this is like my favorite thing. Like he looks at the gun because he's like embarrassed that Nihei's gun is like watching this happen, and he pulls his shirt oh. over the gun so the gun doesn't have to see it. <laughs> it was like is that what he was doing? Because I was like, what the fuck is he doing? Why does he? It's, uh, okay. it's funny. That makes sense. It was hilarious. <laughs> oh my goodness! But yeah, later later on, the group all meets up, and Asirfa's like. Did you kill my father, Kronke? And Kronke's like, oh, da da da, and it's all very dramatic. Mm-hmm. And and like, um, Inkermot's like, I got these fingerprints, and they match the fingerprints I got off you at the at the horse race, and like that means you did it. And I, I'm like, okay, fingerprints in the 1800s is total bullshit. Like that's that was not a thing. That, that seems, that's, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's not at all a thing. But okay, if you want to make it that way for the plot. Um, and then she, Inkram, and then Inkermont acknowledges that she got the fingerprints from Surumi, though. So Tanagaki's basically like, Surumi just wants you all to kill each other. Let's all just like think about this for a minute before we go any further. Because basically now it's Inkermot versus uh, Kiranke. Because like one of them, e- either Kiranke killed Asirfa's father, or Inkermot like is lying. You know what I mean? So something's mm-hmm. going on. Um, and Sh- Shirai, she's like, oh, so basically at this point they're like, okay, Shirai, she did. Nopera really have blue eyes because if he had blue eyes, he could have been Asirfa's father. But if he didn't, then he couldn't have been. Which I would argue, I mean, genetically, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but I guess it would be a clue. And Shirashi's kind of like, I'm not sure because he has no face, so I tried never to look at his face too closely. <laughs> um, yeah, that was interesting. So that didn't work. Yeah. And then the shot. Uh, okay, there's a shot like where Tanagaki's like, did you sleep with me because, because like you wanted protection or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Inkerbot's like, 
no, what happened was just because of the otter. And like he has this face yeah. for a second that he makes, and he's, he just says, sea otter. Sea otter. And like with the face. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God. Someone needs to make that a meme as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at this point, um, sure, she basically is like, well, but our, our goal hasn't changed. Like, we still have to meet No Parabo, and we won't know the truth until we do. Um, so it doesn't matter at this point. We're still doing the same thing. We're still going towards the same thing. And Sugimoto's like, and you know what? If either Inkermot or Kiranke just mysteriously dies during the journey, I'll kill the other one just for good measure. <laughs> since, like, that's, I mean, let's be real. If one of you just mysteriously dies, the other one probably murdered them. So I'll, I'll take care of that. Ha ha ha. It's not a funny joke, yeah. but is it a joke? Because the look not. on their faces is pretty funny because they're, like, truly a little bit worried about that. <laughs> Inkermot is, like, yeah. smiling, like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so then later on, there's a scene at the prison where no parabo is being held. And apparently, like, all the guards know to stay away from him. And there's a new guard who's warned about this. And then we learn that the new guard is, like, a spy that works for the Seventh. Mm -hmm. um, and the other guards find out pretty pretty quickly that he's a spy. And, and the new guard is, like, told to let the prisoners kill him since he's a spy. Um, but it doesn't work out, and like the new guy just kills all the prisoners they send after him instead. Yeah, and the guards kind of like, "Well, fuck this shit. I'm done. I I'm not fucking with this," and like runs away and tells like the the um, warden of the prison, like, "Oh, I killed the guy after he killed the prisoners. Don't worry, I'll just report him missing." And I'm like, "That's that's some sly shit. That way you don't have to get in trouble for uh, not killing him." Yeah. Um, and you find out that this new spy who works for the seventh is also in love with Surumi, which of course, because everyone's fucking in love with Surumi, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> so like uh when Inkermot told Serpa that Kurt Kiranke killed her father, um, and then he like shows up and sh there that was like a really telling moment because Inkermot, when she sees that Kiranke is like there, like panics for a second and i was like all right she's yeah. a liar she's lying about this shit mm. um i don't know i mean she might have panicked because she thinks he's gonna kill them all i guess so it doesn't mean she's a liar i think this is all calculated though like i think her sleeping with tanagaki is also calculated uh like i think leo said like potentially to protect herself is like they say at one point in the show um like, I, I just think she's such a conniving character. I do not trust her at all. Uh, and I think she's trying think she to can... do something by, like, lying to a Serpa about who killed her father. I, do, I, do, I don't think we I think really know her some... true motive yet. We don't. I think that's yeah. what yeah, it is. Yeah, I think yeah. there's some calculation there. I don't think she's telling the whole truth. I think we'll find out she's lying about something. But I also think that she does have genuine feelings for Tanagaki based on some of the embarrassment and stuff we see. I don't think all of it's faked. Yeah, and then she gets confident again when she goes into the, the fingerprinting thing, which actually this is like the early 1900s because like the Russo-Japanese War like ended in okay. like 1905. Well, the first time they started like filing it for criminals was 1892. Yeah, so. but like she doesn't have yeah. to file it if she can like compare the fingerprint to another fingerprint. Well, but like you if know. you look at two fingerprints on a piece of paper, are you really going to be able to be like, yep, that's <laughs> yeah, the right. exact same <laughs> also, one? Also, the other thing like, is that no, like you're she, not. She, they say she got this information through like Lieutenant Sarumi, who's like the only one who would have had access to that blade. So it's like, yeah, of course I don't trust this. Like who would trust this? This. Yeah. Um, well, the way that works, Kat, yeah. is then you do it on a, you lay that over another fingerprint of theirs, and that's how you match them up. Like you didn't. I, yeah. I, I just, remember doing this in elementary school. They're like they showed us how they actually did it. Oh, I remember that too. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why they had. Do you think they just, just did I'm that just to get saying, our fingerprints in elementary school, Leo? <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. It's all, it's all calculated. They all have our. Well, it's just like how they're all they're all trying to get our DNA with those DNA kits now. They're like, ooh, you're gonna find out fun things about yourself, and secretly they're just filing it all. Also, in that there's like a brief after credit scene uh, where this like badass looking guy shows up, and I was like, 
I wonder if this is a Serpa's father. I feel like we're going to keep meeting people. I'm going to be like, I wonder if this is a Serpa's father. <laughs> it's going to happen a lot. In, in the she just is going on the daddy tour. Yeah. Like, are you in my the, father? Are yeah. you my father? And then in the end, B comes like, am I a Serpa's father? Am I a Serpa's father? <laughs> yeah. I just ate some sea meat. It was become all along. Jeez. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Oh, man. All right. So, so let's, let's move on to the wind right. with the running. The, the wind with the running, the running <laughs> yeah. with the wind. Yes. So, exactly. Unfortunately, we're only on episode eight of 23. <laughs> God, I hope this oh, is the way Oh, shut Leo. You did it. Just start <sighs> explaining what happens this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kakaru returns to find everybody like having a small after party when he thinks they should be having a review session. Though most of them think it's a, it's just basically a little bit of both. Uh, and they all like congratulate Kakaru because he like did so well and... And then they all get kind of bummed out because they all feel like, you know, they were losers in the race. Uh, but then, like, Yuki Hiro, like, reminds them it's more about their time since their real goal is to qualify at the Hakone Ikiden Qualifier. Uh, which, that doesn't really help too much since uh, Kakuru and Haiji are the only two with good enough time so far. Right. And this, I got kind of lost on this part. Kakuru says to Haiji that they can make it, but he's mad when he says it. I was like, what? What? I, I don't know the route that we're going with this. He seems to be like all gung ho and serious now since like uh, the guy at the race, like Fujioka, like kind of like said, like, you're going for Lead the Hogone, aren't you? And now he's even yeah. more serious and even more pissed at everybody. I don't know. Cocker is kind of just a little shit and he needs to get over it. It's so annoying <laughs> so, at this point. Haiji tells everybody that's true and they will be practicing more come tomorrow. And at this point, I think he's just a, silly, ser- a serial killer. And this is his like fucked up way of trying to kill people. <laughs> Which it, <laughs> like which it, I, I'm starting to agree. Like he is just a madman. I mean, that explains like his weird positive attitude. You know, the really happy vibe. <laughs> um, and then like Kakaro leaves the uh, room, and Akihiro follows him and tries to you know help cool him down a little bit. And they end up talking about when Akihiro was in high school, and his coach, like so he ran. I don't remember if they said it before. Told him to stop running because he doesn't really have a body built for long distance, and he kind of has he has a bigger frame person. Tell me about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. but he not all of us can be six two uh, <laughs> but he loved that feeling he got as like when they were lining up just before the race to start and then cocker is like well then you should keep running then and yuki hero is like in the hallway and he overhears it and like he, it looks like to me like he just lost this last of his resolve to keep fighting the running thing since like Akihiro was kind of his only last ally. <laughs> right. So, yeah. like, and then like later on you see he's like, he's like, fuck it. Might as well be serious. Yeah. 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 And the next day at practice, Kakuru and Akihiro uh, decided to like practice at their own pace. So they, they set off ahead and like they're doing it so they can kind of improve themselves. But this is it throughout the episode. It turns out to be working against them. Yes. Uh, then, that evening, Prince is like shopping for a treadmill so he can at least read manga as he runs. And I thought the rest of the scene was stupid, but I'm sure you you two thought it was funny. It was all right. Like the guys in the room. Actually, I really didn't care too much about that scene. I did care about how expensive the treadmills are because, goddamn, they're so expensive. They are expensive. <laughs> they really are. Like, also, I'm not really sure why Prince is so obsessed with getting a treadmill. So he like, can I, read I manga. Thinking, while like, he so runs. he can read manga. While he runs. That's, that's well, all like, the motivation he needs. <laughs> But, but like he can't just keep running all the time. Like like we've already discussed this. It's not gonna help him to run twenty four hours a day. Like it's not gonna make him better. Oh, it's just gonna well, make you him need weaker. to have a sit down with Haiji because no. he's oh not he's not done this episode yet. No, you see, Kat, it's easy well, if, if you just run while reading manga on a treadmill for two weeks. You will clearly cut fifteen minutes off of your five k time. Like it's so easy. Like, uh-huh. You just got to do it. <laughs> Of course. Okay. Well, and also Run Prince all are, already night. looks like a zombie. Like like later on when he's doing the run while while everyone else is running past him, he legit looks like a zombie. Yeah, his his form like he's is got his so hands bad. Out. Like it has to be hurting him physically. So it has I was, to. I was briefly encouraged though when he like accidentally got on the treadmill later in this episode. Sorry, Leo. And like he actually <laughs> started running like kind of fast, like because he was just. Not used to it, and I was like, "Huh, maybe there's yeah, something here." Like, We've never seen him run this fast. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so into the next scene, I was like, oh, "We're gonna nope." Uh, I like that Yuki Hero brings up the fact at the, ne- at the next practice that they don't want to do too much and <laughs> injure themselves. So, 
what does Haiji do? He has him do interval runs in between the build-up runs because the build-up runs are apparently hard on your joints. And <laughs> where the fuck is he getting this logic? <laughs> it was so ridiculous. He's crazy. His, I was like, his <laughs> answer to preventing injuries was more running. I'm like, you are... No. <laughs> Who wrote this? I, like, on one hand, I was glad that the show was finally acknowledging that this is like a ridiculous plan, and like you can. It was a trick. <laughs> and, yeah, and then Haiji's just like, "Okay, let's just have more running." Then <laughs> it's just like, no, no, that's not how this works. It, it doesn't make just, any sense. Just look into Haji's eyes with that smile. Yeah, he's trying to. He's kill definitely him. trying to kill. He him. just wants them all to die. That's really what it is. He's a murderer. He just, he's like the demon of hell or something. Like I love it. Like it. Uh, some anime actually got me inspired a long time ago to work out and stuff. That was uh, uh, Kenichi Mightiest Disciple, which was awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah. So like this, I, I got this a little inspiration. Kind of scares me because I don't want to see somebody get like. Oh right! Inspired by it, and then because they're not, they don't really know what they're doing. They just go way too hard, and then they well, just fuck I will themselves say over. The attitude that this anime takes towards running is a good one. That like anyone can run, and you don't have to run just because you're the best runner. You can run and not be the best and still get a lot out of it. Right. Like I think that's what they're trying to say with Nico. Yeah. So I do. I do think you can get something from it. It's just like be aware that. The amount that they are exercising for this is not advisable in any way. Yeah. So <laughs> Don't do stupid. that. Yeah, so yeah. It turns out like Kakaru is like edging Haiji on by getting on everybody when they start to like tire and you can hear her thinks it's unsafe again. Like that I'm like stick with it or not. Uh Kakaru goes out for his night run and and of all people to tell him to rest, that resting is good, it's Haiji. <laughs> Fuck this guy. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. You I was like, I know. It's like, Haiji, I don't even know what you want. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so um, oh, Prince also ends up getting a treadmill because it's King, right? Yeah, his parents had one. Okay, King, or is it King or Shindo? I don't remember. It was one of them. Uh, uh, okay, whatever. But their Shindo. parents, regardless, had just had like a treadmill sitting in the shed and they were going to throw it away. So they had it shipped to him, which was probably pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, to get it shipped, that's probably very expensive. Yeah. And so we know that Akihiro is kind of having a body image thing right now, and so he's like kind of skipping out on his food to try and lose some more weight. But when you're like, it's about, well, I mean, even if you were doing half of what they're doing, when you're trying to build muscle and endurance, skipping out is one of the damn worst things you can do. Right. Your body really needs that energy at this point. So like, and then yeah. like you kind of see this at next practice says. Kakaru blows up on Hanako because he got the same time as two weeks ago and like he blames her for not timing him correctly and then like Haji's like hey leave her alone yeah, <laughs> at least he says he's sorry like if he had not said yeah. that I would have been even more pissed at him but yeah yeah, and then like Hanako's like okay you're whatever yeah but then like back at the house Haji tells Kakaru that he's not running in the next meet because he already has a qualifying time but like Kakaru wants to set a record or something like that he's just like obsessed at this point Haiji's like eventually yells at him because uh, Kakaru thinks like the team's just half-assing it and he's like you're a dumbass if you think this te- people on the team are half-assing it and then like that's when Prince comes down for some water and interrupts him mm-hmm. and like Kakaru goes to leave and he looks at Prince and he goes if your time does not improve from the last time uh, will you quit the team and then there's like kind of a pause and he's like for at least their sake and i was like ouch fuck dude <laughs> yeah. i know like I, I was just thinking to myself like D- you need to shut your mouth cocker like you you're taking it too far he's he has like, that cock in his take mouth it too fucking- <laughs> <laughs> ah, i love it. Shut it oh my god he really does he always has to have a cock in his mouth oh, <laughs> oh my man. god guys <laughs> i love it uh. So, he, always, he always does he always says something shitty yeah it's true i i also i I agree he's being a dick. At the same time, somebody kind of need to say that to Prince because, like, how is this going to happen? Like, he needs to start improving drastically if he's going to be a part of this team. Uh, or yeah. else he's just going to have to face the perspective of, like, quitting because they're not going to make it with him if he's running 30-minute 5Ks. So... Are, are they going to, like, 30-minute 5Ks like would the... be an improvement become. <laughs> True, that it would yeah. be an improvement <laughs> Are they gonna have the like let's get down to business like song for Prince next Maybe. episode? Is that what's gonna happen? What like, manga you know, the is he gonna song? read that's gonna like inspire him? 
<laughs> to yeah. run faster. I wonder. To defeat the 5K. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 oh, I, we over that the the not so funny scene that was all comedy. There was that part that you liked, Becom, where he was talking about the uh, the manga. Oh, uh, wait, which part? I don't remember this. <laughs> yeah, he he was. Uh, it was like a a boxing one, and he said he was just really happy. Cause he, cause, oh uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah they, Akihiro um, quit smoking, and he yes. likened it to who, who Rikishi so-and-so from Ashi no Joe, who, not drinking yeah, water. Yeah, stop drinking yeah. water, so they get down in a weight class. And I'm like, that's actually a real thing in wrestling. <laughs> oh well, yeah, the, for sure. But yeah. like, I think in Ashi no Joe, Rikishi does not do so well in that fight. I won't spoil, but like, it did not go well, well for him not out. drinking water. <laughs> when when you're not when you're dehydrated, you don't perform very well. well yeah. Turns out. They, in out. this episode, they said he died. So <laughs> yeah, I, they do say he died in the episode. So I guess <laughs> spoilers run with the wind. What the fuck? Um, <laughs> Spoiling other shit. <laughs> I also like there was like a throwaway line where uh, King all of a sudden got really into the running uh, because he went to an interview and he mentioned the Hakoni Ekiden and they really liked it. And so I was like, oh, we kind of talked about that a couple weeks ago. Like, maybe this will good, look good on King's resume. And, like, it already is, like, even just oh, in wait. interviews. King's the guy who's trying to get the jobs, right? Yeah, he's, like, the big guy with the buzz cut. Yeah. Okay, that, then I was wrong. It wasn't King. It was Shindo's parents. parents. Yeah, yeah, Shindo's. Yeah. 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 Uh, who had the treadmill. Yeah. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, takeaway from this episode is Hygie is a madman who's trying to kill everybody else for sure. Definitely. <laughs> That's my take. <laughs> 100%. Uh, but yep. maybe Hygie's just a rascal who needs a bunny girl to set him straight. Right, Kat? <laughs> exactly. All right. So next we got episode 8 of 13. Bunny Girl Sensei. Wash it all away on a stormy night. <laughs> all right. So the episode starts out and Futaba is making curry at Sakuta's house. I guess because she's still there. And, like, later she, like, bathes and Sakuta is, like, talking to her again through the door. Like, this has become a thing somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, so she talks about how she did make the account earlier. Like I thought. Yes. Yeah, you were right. 100%. But then, yeah. But then didn't know what to write. And so then she's like, well, I just wanted attention. And so I started taking the pictures. And it's, like, an inferiority complex almost for her because she, she like, hates her body and she hates how guys look at her but she also has been using it and it's like a it's a contradiction right mm-hmm. so she just feels terrible about it but continues to do it she feeds and it's off of it at the same this, time as hating it yeah yeah and, and it's caused this adolescent syndrome and you kind of see that like when anytime like um, Sakuta encourages her to show off she's like no she's disgusted mm-hmm. but like obviously part of her still wants to do something with it it's, it's an interesting little thing she's got going on um so he kind of asked her like what do you want to do and she says like she would like the other her to stop and sakuta promises to talk to the other her about it so at the same time mai and sakuta have the conversation that like that was foreshadowed before mm-hmm. about like oh we have to talk and you find out that Maya's agency has ordered her not to date and told her that she cannot see Sakuta privately. <laughs> um, and she's like, I haven't decided what to do yet because it's a problem for both of us. So we should decide together. Good as, couples as rule. They do there you go. In private in his home. I was <laughs> like, what? Yes. what does Sakuta say? He says, we can take a strategic retreat from our relationship so you can be a model student for your agency. My look, what a what a nice boyfriend, Kat. What a good guy this guy is. <laughs> I mean, no, because then he gets to hang out with other girls and half date them while still saying, like, oh, I'm still kind of dating you. It benefits him, Become. He's not a model boyfriend. I know, I know. For this? I'm being somewhat sarcastic, but they kind of present him as being like, oh, such a nice guy in this moment. He, this it's guy hilarious. is, like, a, secretly a terrible boyfriend. <laughs> like, he's a nice person. He's one of these people who's a nice person. But a terrible boyfriend. You ever known people like that? He just, you're just has, like you're a good friend. I would never date you. Yeah, he just has so much to give. You know, he, he's just uh-huh. so much of him to give to everyone. So can't uh-huh. hold him down. Sure, you can't. You can't just. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> terrible. But um, so so Mai's like, all right, if that's what you want, 
Um, and then Sakuta sees the other Futaba and is like, hey, I'm kind of single. I'm going to hang out with you. And um, she kind of basically says what the uh, the original Futaba says, that she hates who she is. <laughs> and she says Sakuta should give up on both of them and that the world doesn't need two Futabas. Um, and Sakuta asked the original, like the... The original Futaba later, when he sees her at his house, if she can't think of a way to return to one person, and she says that now that they're having different experiences and memories, like she really doubts that they can return to being one person, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Um, And then the next day at school, the other Futaba like has this scene where she fans Kunimi after he's running track, yeah, um, which is interesting. Um. And then later she gets texted, like, on her, on the other account where she posts the sexy pictures from a guy saying he recognizes her uniform and wants to hang out with her, which is like, I want to fuck you. Yeah. Come meet up with me. And and if she doesn't, he'll tell the school. And honestly, I don't even know why she freaks out because she does. Like, she freaks out a lot. And I'm like, there is no fucking nudity in these pictures. You are fine. What's he going to be like? Oh, you posted a picture of your torso in a uniform that's slightly sexy. Like, oh, there is nothing probably wrong with these pictures. Stupid school policy, like yeah. the ones where like they can't have jobs and stuff like that. Probably some code probably. of conduct but it's bullshit. Not, yeah. It, but she's not even going to get in that much trouble. Like, I don't know why she freaks out so fucking much. Like, God damn. Well, it's also because that she, she that hates like, that guys see her this way. Like, she talks about them like the monkey guys that react <laughs> to her mature body that matured before all the other girls. And, like, she hates how they look at her. And this is just, like, a very aggressive moment of that, you know? So I think that's part of why she freaks out as well. I'm just saying, it's not like she's on a stripper pole with, like, floss <laughs> panties on. No, mm-hmm. she's not. I mean, the wait for on. the OVAs, so- baby. Woo! No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so Sakuta grabs the phone while Futaba just flips her shit and he's like, I'm calling the police. And he texts that to the guy. And Futaba's like, Sakuta, delete my account. I can't do it. And then she gets really fucking clingy with Sakuta. Like, grabbing him and basically acting like a little baby and is like, I want you to stay over tonight because I can't be alone. And <laughs> I guess her parents are out. And I also guess she's rich. We didn't know that before. Uh, I'm guessing her parents are gone a lot, which is why she wasn't used to eating with people. Yeah. Um, and this bitch is fucking clingy <laughs> that day. Like, holy shit. Like, calm your tits, girl. Like, she's taking a bath and she's like, are you still there? Are you still? I'm like, bitch, you can see his outline right there. Okay. I <laughs> read this as glass. she was afraid of like this guy who tweeted her like coming and oh, finding her. That's how I read that. She She's afraid of some guy who doesn't even know who she is. Come, come on, girl. I, I, I took her as a stronger bitch than this. That's all I'm saying. Maybe. I was a little disappointed in Fudova because I like her a lot as a character. Mm-hmm. And I was like, come on, girl. You you can get a little bit more of a stiff lip here. <laughs> um, but I don't know. So she gets really insecure and like he, she sleeps on the couch with him on the floor. And later they wake up and she talks about how she's been really insecure since she started high school. And Sakuta calls Kunimi and says like, oh, Futaba's in trouble. You should come. And Kunimi like bikes over in the middle of the night. And Futaba just cries, like seeing that he's done that for her. Like it really touches her that he did that. Mm -hmm. Um, And they get drinks and like fire sparkler things. You know, those like wands that you set one end on fire. We've all seen an an, uh, idiot romance anime. You're like, you're the best. Yeah. (laughs) They're in every single one. Honestly, I think these fucking, these fire sparkler things. Like, okay, I never understood them when I was, like, 13. <laughs> yeah, it's me too. literally just It's literally just a light on the end of a stick. It's not special. It's not interesting. Well, obviously, you I guys weren't understand. waving it around because when you wave it around, it leaves a trace through the air. Well, you maybe if you're, eights. like, high. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you've, like, ingested a lot of cocaine or something, it's interesting. <laughs> I don't know. It'd probably but work like, for you right now, Kat. 
Yeah. You should maybe. Try. <laughs> maybe. But I'm just saying, if you're just sitting there waving it around, like, it can't be that interesting. It's I, I don't even kids. understand. <laughs> yeah. I don't even understand how a five year old finds it interesting. Ooh, fire. Like, it's, it's dumb. But anyway, they buy these and they do the dumb thing that all anime do with them. <laughs> and then, um,. And then Kunimi's, and then like Kunimi's like, I wondered what was going on at first when I came over, but when I saw you crying, I didn't care anymore, and I didn't bother to ask. And I'm like, okay, so apparently, like he really cares about her. Are we supposed to be happy that he really cares about her, or like worried for his emotional infidelity? Like I don't know what's going on here. Um, <laughs> I think we're supposed to be happy that he's a nice person. I think. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in the end, it doesn't go anywhere. But I'm kind of like, this is a weird thing. Yeah. Um, he comes home the next day. Like, Futaba, or Sakuta comes home the next day to the other Futaba, like the OG one. Because he's been out with the <laughs> new one all night with Kunimi. So he goes to sleep, and the OG one sees the screensaver of the new one and Sakuta and Kunimi like hanging out on the beach at night. And she's like really upset and like really crushed by this. And he, when uh, Sakuta wakes up, he finds out that Futaba went shopping and she's left her phone behind and has gone like a wall basically. And Sakuta's like, fuck. It goes to the, the new Futaba and is like, Oh shit. Is she here? And Futaba's like, nope, she's not here, and we are not the same person yet. And she gives it, like, she kind of is like, I would go here if I was her. Yeah. And the place that she tells him is the school. So you see, like, a shot of Sakuta driving his bike in the rain mm-hmm. to see her there. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like a romance novel or some bullshit. Well, I'm going to tear and this then- down as soon as you get through this. <laughs> <laughs> and then Futaba says, like, I'm going to disappear right in this classroom and the other me is better than me and I just want to die and that picture hurt me and boo hoo and acts like a big old bitch again. Um, and he kind of like blows off her reaction is like, well, but you and you and Kunimi and me should should like meet next week at the beach and we'll do the same thing the new you and, and us did. And it'll all be fine. And, like, he turns around and just passes out because, I guess, oh, he, all the rain just exhausted him. Okay, and I'm so. like, that would not happen. <laughs> okay, okay, so this is nothing new in anime. Like, the guy doing something with, for the girl where he had to, like, do some physical exertion, usually against the elements or something. And then, like, he's seen as heroic but passes out from it. But I'm calling complete bullshit on this one because <laughs> Sakata rode his bike. Okay, in the rain. Okay, with the wind. Okay, during August. <laughs> <laughs> no, if we Leo. Take that, yeah, it's not that cold. It's that take killer that log- Japanese rain. <laughs> it's, he's probably in Fuku- <laughs> Fukushima. It's like radioactive rain. <laughs> yeah. So by that logic, if he swims a couple of laps in a lukewarm pool, he's going to pass out. Oh, no, yeah, he's going to die. Absolutely. Jeez. I don't know how all the well, characters also, in three haven't died yet. They touch water Also, Futaba the also <laughs> went through the rain to get there, right? So, like, she's okay, somehow. <laughs> Maybe she had a casual walk. Like, I'm saying if Sak- Sakuto was in Run With The Wind, he's dead for oh, sure. Oh, no, he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Oh. oh, my gosh. But, yeah, so, I don't know. Okay, so, he wakes up he, in the hospital. Mai is there. Futaba's in the waiting room. He goes to see Futaba in the waiting room. Which is miraculously empty, except the two of them. Which, in a hospital, would not happen. <laughs> True. The waiting room is never empty. All right. Uh, Futaba, like the original Futaba, wants to see the fireworks, too. She's really upset, and she calls herself, mm-hmm. like the other Futaba, and mm-hmm. tells her, like, I want to see the fireworks together, and then disappears. So I guess she turns back into one person. But yeah. I thought it was really interesting that the OG one is the one who disappears. Not yeah. not the the new one. Like what did you guys take that as? Well, I do think that they basically came to an understanding. Like I think the reason they joined back together is because both of them wanted the same thing at the same time. 
uh, and they, yeah. they kind of like accepted each other's like wants and desires. I also thought it looked so much like that scene in the Matrix where Trinity like, oh, God. goes goes back, <laughs> exits the Matrix, and the phone falls. So I was like, "Oh my God, she's in the Matrix." Sakata is Neo. <laughs> <laughs> that was my new nice. theory. My I, new fan I theory. didn't really read into it. I just kind of, I mean, it made sense for like a dramatic effect. And then also like the other food taba was at their home. So I, I don't know. That's just, that just kind of made sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of took it as like the new one is like her, the way this, that she wants to change and like the difference, the, the ways that she's changing as a person. Well, she, yeah, she's kind of like reinvented the OG herself one. now. So it would make sense yeah, she went the to the new one. Yeah, the OG one is, is kind of like the way she used to be. So it makes sense like she's moved to- more towards the new one. I don't know. Yeah, and the it's new one had though. kind of already reconciled like out at the beach with Kunimi and Sakata. Mm-hmm. So like I think they both kind yeah. of approached each other from different uh, directions. And so I don't think she's like completely like giving up on her old self. I think she's just like they're both growing towards each other. Uh, yeah, I mean, because you see like her – like reconciled with herself later and she does have the glasses so like she still has she's not t- completely just turned into the new her but like i think she's leaned more towards that is my point that, i think that's why that one disappeared the og one yeah yeah so at the very end you see the reconciled fudaba going to the fireworks with the two of them in a yukatara like finally reconciled like yes i'm a sexy person like i can wear a yukatara um which i i liked and she, she does tell Kunimi how she feels at the fireworks show, but is like, you don't have to say anything because I know that that's not going to work out. I just want to tell you. And then she tells him to make up with his girlfriend later. And like, he's like, yeah, I'll do that. And like, she cries a little. And it's, it's interesting. It's a, good, it's a good way to end the, the episode. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, my favorite scene in this episode is when Sockets is sleeping and his cats walk on his face. It's a great scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's like wow, yeah, relatable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, break time, guys! All right, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, time for break. sure. We'll let Cat rest her voice while we let some of our fellow <laughs> podcasters talk for a little bit. We'll be right back. All right, we'll see you. Hi, I'm JD, your host of the Red Leaf Retrocast your best location to learn, remember, and relive the past to the present. Our podcast has four shows for you to listen to between retro gaming, modern gaming, anime, and even wrestling. The Retro Gaming Cast covers discussion topics, and each episode we discuss retro games picked based on a decided theme for that episode, ranging from space all the way to console specials like the old handheld Game Boy. Our modern gaming cast is monthly and covers video game titles that were released in that previous month. Each anime cast, we focus to review a retro anime each and every episode, like the original Mobile Suit Gundam to the racing hit Initial D. But that's not all. We also keep up with the seasonal shows by occasionally doing impressions and reviews as well. Finally, our last show is about wrestling, where we keep the rising indie scene up to date while also covering shows from the bigger promotions like Ring of Honor, New Japan, and WWE, so we cover it all. We also cover a retired wrestler every episode in what we call the Wrestler Spotlight and are currently on a quest covering old WCW Thunder episodes from the late 90s, every cast. So if any one of those casts sound like something you'd like to check out, that's the Red Leaf Retrocast Gaming, Anime, and Wrestling, found at iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. Also, you can learn, remember, and relive the past to the present. We can't wait to see you soon. Warning, the following clip may contain descriptions of explicit behavior conducted by Bishi Boys. 
Now, that's not to say he didn't get physical. Quite the opposite, in fact. Our boy Kent was researching all the ways to please a woman. Pull this lever. And he put some of that learning into effect, if you know what I mean. Let me give you a scene from the show that I really quite liked. My research shows that women find it pleasurable if men place their fingers here, then apply some pressure and begin to rub that area. <laughs> Do you enjoy that? Is it giving you pleasure? Please respond. I need verbal... <laughs> <laughs> Please respond. <laughs> I gotta get this out. I gotta get this out. Get it out. Please respond. I need verbal confirmation that this is something that you enjoy. <laughs> Heroin Sadie tells him that it's hurting her as he's rubbing her too vigorously. Ow. Despondent Ken removes his fingers and looks at them. Perhaps I applied too much pressure. Don't worry, Kent. Head pats are difficult to master. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Yata from the Reanimator Pod. If you want to hear more, you can check out our website. That's R E N M A T O R P O D dot com. We release new episodes every Monday. Don't drop that. Hey, don't drop that. And here's another tasty morsel from the Trash Pandas Watch Anime Podcast. Some, some fan service. Yeah. I mean, it worked pretty well in Dragon Ball. Do you remember those scenes of Bulma? Bulma was running around in a bunny outfit for the longest time. I know. A Toriyama. <laughs> we can get the Dragon Balls, and then we can make our wish. Bulma's panties. <laughs> <laughs> did Oolong wish for Bulma's panties, or did you just wish for a pair of panties? I think it was just a pair of panties. I'm sure it's different in the Japanese than it is in the English dub, but... Yeah, he just waits for panties. They're probably used. As always, you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter at Trash Panda Anime. You can find us on our website, tpwapodcast.com. You can also find us on assorted sites like SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. We are back. And since Kat has now hopped up on more of her meds and drugs, let's talk <laughs> about another drug, banana fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Episode- nice transition. Yes, episode 20, <laughs> The Unvanquished. Uh, uh-huh. Yes. Yep. All right, we got to talk about this shit right <laughs> out the gate. <laughs> Let me see the fucking line. <laughs> <laughs> Yacht Lung compares the Corsica Foundation to using the same strategy that, the, the as the train layer put it, the Jews used to control with money. Yes. I, I <laughs> this, okay, it didn't sit well with you, and I just thought this was... R- like a really weird line. Yes, it is so weird. I, I started looking up. I was like, okay, well, maybe it's something to do with the Chinese mafia. So I was like typing in Chinese mafia and Jews. And what I actually kind of found out was like Jewish, there were these Jewish American mobs and they yes. were a, a, such, such a fucking thing. So at this point I'm like, okay, this makes sense to me. And then also like what they did was primarily like, uh, bootlegging in 1920s and then they did like gambling loan sharking and bookmarking which is all big money stuff so i was like okay the, the he yet long's just stating a historical fact at this point this is what he's talking about i just think the translator accidentally put jews not jewish american mobs a which par- makes <laughs> total I w- sense but i wish that was the case like i I thought that was really interesting that you put that together. Like, as I think I would not have had as much of a problem with it if that was what I felt was actually the case. Right. Cause like I said, cause then yeah. he's, it's just a historical fact at this point. So yeah, but go on. Yeah. I was looking into it. Like, so there's <laughs> hilariously, there's this Reddit user named banana bone. Yes. That's actually their username. Uh, <laughs> and like his comment, he's watching, and, he's watching golden Kamui also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His comment in the the Reddit discussion thread for this episode was like regarding the Jewish comments in the party scene, uh, they're directly lifted from the manga and like the manga translation into English changed this to like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies rather than the American Jewish community. Uh, Because, like, the original dialogue is probably born of, like, you know, the stereotypes that equate Jews with like hoarding Mm -hmm. wealth and stuff. And and I think... um, like yeah in the show they say like they're trying to be the Corsican Foundation is trying to become the next US Jewish community uh and it's not it's not nuclear power or ideology that rules the world but money that rules things so they're implying that the Jews rule the United States because of money 
And it's just like a very anti-Semitic like stereotype of like, and also like the biggest problem I have with this by far, by the way, is that like the Corsican Foundation are these like pedophile child rapists mafia, <laughs> and they're like yeah. <laughs> they're trying to compare them to like they're the Jews. just like the Jews. <laughs> I yeah, was like, no. wow, <laughs> banana fish. So, whatever, however you take this, it's just a really awkward line to kick off the episode. Um, but yeah, uh, Is it, isn't it literally the first line? <laughs> it's the first fucking line of the episode. And I was like, "What?" <laughs> I like immediately oh, stopped. And I was like, "What happened?" Oh boy. Anyway, okay. So with that out of the way, uh, they wheel in like a blind Ash who eventually gets like pushed around by Blanca, and Blanca seems to actually notice Ag as pretending to be a waiter, but just doesn't uh, say or do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then they all enact their plan and they storm the place and they're like shooting up and AG pulls his gun on Dino and after much, much hesitation, closes his eyes and shoots him in the shoulder. And as bad as that aim was, he could have easily just shot Ash right in the fucking forehead. He closes his <laughs> eyes like, yeah, really? <laughs> One of the guys even comments like, how could you be that f- so far off that close? Because he's literally, there's like, there's only a table between them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then Ash like uses his superpowers from like that subway one like he hears like a gun being cocked and pulls takes the gun from Aji and turns and shoots the guy even though he can't fucking see shit <laughs> yeah i, I think was it's like, oh, like damn that was ridiculous i wouldn't want yeah. you to be my enemy yeah and then like at the end yet long figures out that blanca only let him be hired so that he could use the excuse of protecting him to help ash so i'm like okay yet long's figuring shit out mm-hmm. but then everybody takes shelter in like an abandoned subway, and one of like Sue Rin's subordinates questions uh, him about like helping Ash, who killed Shorter, and like then he has to like put him in his place by explaining they would end up with like another Arthur if they didn't have Ash there running the place downtown, and like you know there'd just be people dying all the time every day, and like we just need Ash. I don't know how that really convinced them. They're like he fucking killed our boss, is what the other dudes basically say. Right, but. Mm-hmm. You're not really convinced, but then, like, later on, that dude does something to, like, kind of save Surin. So you're like, okay, he bought it, whatever. So Ash and Aji then decide, well, Aji decides, they're going to lay low for the night and hobo it out in the abandoned subway system. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, like, when Ash comes around after, like, taking a nap, he starts yelling at everybody because they're all holed up in the subway and he knows Blanc is going to figure it out. And shortly after, I thought it was Dino's men, but it was actually. Uh, Yet lungs men who uh, show, show up, up and start shooting at them. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, they end up trying and escaping, and they get headed off at one point. And like a few jump in the sewer to try to escape, and Ash and the others like find another manhole to go down. But they're still being pursued, so Ash is like, "I will distract them and lead them a different way." Been like, Ag shoves him into Kane, and he's like, "I oh, know, I'll distract him instead." And he runs off. <laughs> and then like Kane has to like knock, knock Ash out because he's just not cooperating at this point. And like he eventually like wakes up tied up in a bed at. at where Kane's hideout is, so they made it out. And uh, mm-hmm. basically, after Ash shows he is not taking no for an answer to go and find AG, Kane's like, fine, what's the plan, man? Let's do this. <laughs> so Ash intentionally gets like notice on the streets and lures Yutlung's men to a museum where he uses the darkness and like creepy exhibits to fuck with Yutlung's men. Uh, and kills a whole bunch of them. <sighs> God, I wish somebody was keeping a body count right now. For Ash. <laughs> so it's many. Like, it's like night at the museum. Show. Like there's a, it's one like of my night favorite, at the museum horror version. <laughs> one of my favorite kills, like Ash is running down the street, right? And he has his like gun under his arm and he's like shooting into a moving car and like head headshotting these guys. And I'm like, really, Ash? Like, Jesus, you're so good. Yeah, oh, no, man. that would not work. Yeah, so oh, then like man. like uh, some of the men are inside and he's killed those, but there's still a bunch of the men outside. And like so Kane shows up with all his thugs and they like start shooting at Young Lung's men mm-hmm. and then like Ash uses this distraction to actually grab Yet Lung and take him hostage, uh, but Yet Lung men. Okay, but ha- the way he does it is kind of dumb. Like he takes his own braid and like wraps it around his <laughs> yeah. like neck yeah. to like strangle him with his own braid. <laughs> well, he's yeah, also and got I'm the like, knife that wouldn't work. <laughs> like you can't strangle someone with their own braid. You would need to use your hands. Actually, old time <laughs> like, assassins used to use uh, clumps of uh, human hair. Because it was so strong and wound together to strangle people. (laughs) But it's a little hard when it's still attached to their fucking head to use it to strangle (laughs) them. That's the problem. I I don't know. Let's let's, let's do some experiments. (laughs) Uh, Let's try it out. 
But okay, so uh, but Yet Long's men have ended up did capturing Ishii and some of his crew, and they show up with him. And like Ash is like tells Blanca he's like to meet him in the hall of Ocean of Life, and Blanca like takes Ag and the other guys with them, and they basically just agree agree to release each other hostages at the same time. And during it, Ash and Blanca like mildly injure each other. Like Blanca gets like a a knife into the forearm, and Ash gets like a slightly grazed sh- shoulder. But <laughs> fucking Yutlon got the worst of it because Ash just fucking kicks him down these goddamn stairs. <laughs> and like yeah. he, that should have fucked you somebody up. Like Yutlon doesn't even have like a bruise. I'm like, dude, that's. Breaking something you would be if you didn't swallowing right, die. your teeth. Oh, you would yeah. be swallowing some teeth. It's, it's it's like a brutal yeah. kick. Like he missed the first ten steps. He was flying through the air that fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, like so, you would be hurt. Yeah. Uh, so like then outside, Young like runs into Dino, who asks why he didn't ask for his help, and like we know Young doesn't want to play by Dino's rules, but he's like, oh, I wanted to capture him for you and like <laughs> i think dino kind of buys it but not at the same time so like and then that's just the end of that episode <laughs> yeah it was kind of like not a ton of stuff happened it was just like a bunch of action scenes this episode i guess um yeah seeing ash being using his superpowers again <laughs> i was surprised yeah. that ag actually did shoot the and pull the trigger like we predicted last week he would like remain oh, innocent <laughs> Yeah. There's later on. There's another scene where in the sewers and he tried to distract him and he's just shooting the whole clip. <laughs> yeah, which is apparently a 50 round clip and his eyes are closed the whole time. And I'm like, you <laughs> fucking jackass. Well, not efficiently at least. Let's put it that way. Yeah. He's still <laughs> fucking useless. But um, yeah, he did surprise me. The title of this episode, "The Unvanquished," is a reference to a William Faulkner novel from 1938. Uh, and it centers around the story about like this boy and his friend who is a slave, uh, cause it's set in the South. Um, and they become embroiled in like the late stages of the U S civil war and end up in like a lot of violent conflicts, very similar to AG and Ash. I think, uh, Ash is the slave in this instance, basically like trapped because of these people like Dino and everybody. So that's what that's referring to. But yeah. I love mm. all these novel references. I wish I'd been doing this the whole series, but I didn't realize. So what's interesting about Ash's plan is like he was expecting AG to get captured, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, so that yeah, was kinda, I so. <laughs> that's kind of, I don't know, that's kind of sketchy whim to it's go like on. It's kind of you know? against uh, Ash's, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I he could have had a plan B if that did, isn't what happened, but. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. We, we'd have to see. It's all just going to play out in a big whirlwind of stuff. I'm not sure. I feel like one <laughs> of them is going to get banana fish, probably Ash into tr- maybe AG into trying to kill the other one in the end. And it's going to be a big dramatic thing. But we'll see. I'm excited. Hmm. Uh, but I'm more excited for Zombie Land Saga, which had a really interesting episode this week. Go Go Neverland Saga, episode eight. Um, so after their miraculous Vocaloid performance at Saga Rock, uh, the girls are kind of riding high on their new popularity. And Kotaro takes this opportunity to have them go on the offensive and start doing a bunch of like local events and concerts, festivals and TV appearances and such. Uh, we then get this scene of like this extremely scary looking and humongous office worker uh, <laughs> Whose name is Takeo Go, we learn later. Her, they just go by Go uh, for gotta much. Gotta be Yakuza, man. He's huge. He's got a big scar and everything. He's a scary guy. Uh, he takes an interest in Fran Shu Shu, but specifically in Lily. We're not sure why at first. But he goes to a photo session event and he lines up to speak with her. And I like when they're setting up this photo session, Kodoro like announces like, okay, we're all going to line up. And like, he kind of quietly says at the end and like, and please don't touch the idols. <laughs> but like, he like adds it on. It's like, oh, don't worry about it. Whatever. <laughs> oh, it's really, it was really funny to me when the big guy gets in the line and the person at the end of the line has to hold up a sign yeah. that says end of the line. And he like taps him on the shoulder and the guy's like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. And he turns around and just like hands him the sign and he holds it up. And it's like, Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. eventually Takeo gets to the front of this line, right? And he can't stop himself. He just grabs Lily by the shoulders. And when I say by the shoulders, I mean by like 50% of her body because his hands are like 
six feet. I, I don't know. They're like three feet <laughs> wide. I, it's ridiculous. They're huge. Um, and Saki's like, what are you doing? Saki comes and flies over and does this rotating, like, rolling Sobot kick, which is, uh, they actually reference it in the anime. It's it's one of Guile's moves from Street Fighter. I guess Charlie also has this kick. Uh, and sends Go, like, Takeo flying across the room, uh, which is amazing because he's huge, like we said. Um <laughs> So they kind of get him in the back room and like Saki's like, what were you doing? You know, you're not to touch the idols. And he says, I'm sorry, but I just couldn't stop myself because uh, I remember this singer named Lily Hoshikawa who was on TV seven years ago. And they don't go far beyond that then, but it just kind of freaks the girls out because they realize that like people could start to recognize them. It could happen to any one of them. Yeah. really. I'm surprised they brought this up because, like, it could yeah. have happened so easily in so many air, like <laughs> times before this. Yes, and I was like, "No, duh, you could be recognized, you fucking idiots." As- yeah, especially Lily and I, I who's probably mm-hmm. no mu- no much older than Sakura, yeah. and then Lily, who yeah. we know specifically was seven years ago. I'm like, people would be recognizing them, especially since they've been on TV left and right, like crazy. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But the show kind of ignores it a little bit until it wants to do an episode about it, I guess. But anyways. Yeah. And so Lily is not with the other girl. She's actually sitting outside in like the courtyard and Sakura goes and talks to her. And this is when Lily drops the bomb on Sakura that this big, scary dude, Takeo, is actually her pappy or her dad. Um, (laughs) And he raised her mostly alone because Lily's mother had passed away. And they used to always watch TV together, which he really, really enjoyed. And she loved how much it made him smile. So you're supposed to feel really sorry for Lily, but I'm feeling like super sorry for this guy. He lost his wife and his fucking daughter. Oh, yeah. No wonder he's at work moping around. Jesus, that poor dude. You know who I feel sorry for? Like Lily's mom. Like, look how tiny she was probably, like based (laughs) on the pictures. And like how giant he is. You know what? I bet she did died like he got a little too passionate one night they were fucking and he just crushed her just I like mean, an ant lily did say that oh my mom takes after me and it's like oh boy <laughs> that implies yeah. some things yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah lily's like i because of how happy it made my dad i wanted to make him smile from inside the tv which is why uh she signed up to become an idol and then he like later became her idol manager and stuff so, but some trouble occurred when Lily started to get a bit older <laughs> and not much older. Like she's like 11 as all of this idol stuff is happening. Um, so number one troubling thing is her dad sort of became obsessed with Lily's TV career and did not pay as much attention to her needs as a person. Number two, more importantly, it turns out that Lily's name was Masao. And we hear like Takeo calling her this. And she's, like, not coming out of her dressing room one time because she's worried about how she's going to look because she's starting to sprout some leg hair. Uh, and she's, <laughs> she's like, oh. And, and Takeo's like, I, you can't look like that forever. You're going to grow up. And then things get even worse when Lily notices that she has a facial hair sprouting. And this is such a shock to her, also on top of, like, all of the stress of like her career and her dad like pushing her to do more and more stuff that she literally dies from the shock of seeing a facial hair and like her dad no like, yeah. so <laughs> she fucking dies from a facial hair yes which okay I know that like the idea is that she realizes that she's gonna look like her dad cause she's spoiler alert a yeah, boy she's a, she was but, a boy like, yeah like, she's going to grow up to look like him because, like, you know, he's hairy and big and all that. But, like, come on, girl. Even women, all women have at least one or two facial hairs. <laughs> just just to let you all know out there, we don't faint and scream when we see them. You, you take your tweezers, you pluck it out. Like, <laughs> that should not be something you die over. All right. Well, she's obsessed like, that with. Was some, that was bullshit. She's obsessed you know that with was bullshit. She's obsessed with looking like a girl because she feels that she is a girl. She considers herself a girl. She's basically a trans girl. Uh, and so like when she sees herself like growing up and going through puberty and starting to look like a boy, she's like, I don't ever want to get older. 
And so that's why, kind of why she's a little bit happy that she becomes a zombie because she will never age now. Um, but yeah, so Sakura hearing all this is like, wait, I don't know if I'm following you quite. Oh my correctly. God. It gives Saki's nickname for her shrimpy a whole new meaning. <laughs> 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 so. Oh God! And as, <laughs> so Sakura asks Lily like to clarify like who is Masao, and Lily's like that was my old name. Uh, and so like they they go and tell like Saki and the others this, and like Saki flies into this like fit of laughter when she hears how masculine Lily's old name was because it's like it's like t- um oh what is it Masao Go, which apparently sounds like really masculine, and so does her dad's name. Um, and so. Like, I asked Lily, all right, so, like, what happens now? And, like, Lily, like, immediately responds, I will always be Lily, especially since I'm a zombie now who will never change. And so the girls are like, all right, fine, I guess. And then so they wonder if Kotaro knew about this. And they go talk to him. He's like, hell, yeah, I knew. (laughs) Um, And so (laughs) Saki's kind of annoyed with Kotaro for, like, hiding this, but, like, basically backs Lily up saying, like, Masao is Lily now, and there shouldn't be any problems, so I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, And, like, I guess Kotaro backs her up, and he tells them, like, to all get out, like, just stop complaining and go practice. Uh, And the girls are, like, looking at Lily as she sleeps, saying, like, how cute she is. And Saki's just like, well, it doesn't matter what kind of junk she's got. She's Lily. So, <laughs> And then Junko has this look on her face. Yeah, when she hears junk, <laughs> look, yeah, she, she gets very yeah. blushy. Um, so then we then see what happened with Takeo, Lily's fat father, after she died. Like, he became, you know, furious with himself, uh, blamed himself. He took his TV and threw it through the wall, which is why he didn't watch it at work earlier in the episode. He hates TV now. Um but he also decides, like, the girl he saw couldn't have been his, like, daughter, Masao, like, or, or Lily. He goes to their next event and speaks with Lily to, like, basically apologize. And he also asks her for, like, an extra small t-shirt because he used to have a kid. Uh, but he was a bad father to her who didn't care for her properly. Uh, this is what he tells Lily. And, of course, Lily's still having to try and hide that she knows that this is her father. And he asks if her father was a nice man, and she tells him that he is. So, like, by proxy, she kind of tells him. Right, right. Yeah. And, like, he, he'll probably take that shirt and probably put it on their little shrine that the yeah. Japanese people do, you know. So that's kind of cool. And so he apologized to Lily for everything that happened, uh, like, in place of his daughter, basically, and tells her he won't be coming back and... Lily tries to hold it in, but, like, when they get home later, like, she breaks down and cries in Sakura's arms and realizes that her father actually loved her this whole time. And so the girls get together and they decide, like, we need to do something. We can't just let this stay as it is. And so they decide, all right, there's one thing only we can do. And they even go to Kotaro and Kotaro agrees to this. So they decide to hold a live concert uh, with a new song that is, like, a ballad for Lily to sing called To My Dearest. Uh, which is clearly directed at Takeo, who they invite uh, through a letter, and he shows up. Uh, and it like both the ballad basically both mm-hmm. apologizes to him for like her leaving him earlier than she wanted to, but also like implores him to like keep watching her because she'll always love him. And it's it's really really sweet. And also, this performance was not as CG as previous performances. Like Leo said last episode, like he heard they went away from it and this was much more hand drawn and it definitely looked better. Like yeah. I, I liked it a lot. Um, and so the episode ends with Takeo, like watching TV with his coworkers for a change because he doesn't hate TV, TV anymore. And they're kind of just smiling at the, uh, the Yakitori commercial and Lily smiling. And I was like, wow, that was a really nice episode. Leave it to Mappa to have, good LGBT representation in their anime. Like, especially if there was one little note, uh, if if you're looking closely in the scene where Sakura is talking to Lily. I'm, I'm glad you caught that because I missed that and that's awesome. Yeah, I, I think I, I saw this on Twitter. I wish I could remember who first posted this. That is really interesting. Yeah, Sakura is wearing shorts that had the color of the transgender flag uh, in that scene. And so it's like, you can okay. tell where MAPA stands on this issue. So yeah. <laughs> good well, for them. I did, I did give them props. Like, this is probably the best way that i've seen like a transgender character handled Mm -hmm. like because usually they'll come out and be like he's actually a man or you know or something like that and it was much more subtle 
Like, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? There was like a little bit of and shock. Like Sakura done. was like shocked initially, but then they immediately just like rolled with it. Cause they were like, who cares? Yeah. We're fucking zombies anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I, I was a little confused as to why they didn't have like the, the normal thing where eventually she would go to him and be like, I'm your daughter. But like, mm-hmm. I'm a zombie now, but like I can still see you sometimes. Or, or like, cause it, it kind of like feels like she just sort of abandoned him. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, wouldn't wouldn't she want to see him? I, I think she I really does, really but like she's that. worried about outing like the rest of them possibly, and just I don't know. Like, it she is very mature mm. about this for like an eleven to twelve year old. <laughs> to be honest, like you would think that she would yeah. just blurt it out, like I am your daughter, but. No, she doesn't. But I, I like that they at least reach out to him the way that they can through the idol group. It, it's all right. I mean, like, if, if they're not going to tell people who they are, then that's at least a decent way to get the feelings across that she needed to express. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, really I like guess. I just, it. I was a little bugged by it, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't anything too bad. So, yeah. since they pulled back the funny and went, like, fully emotional, of course, I... I still enjoyed this epi- episode a lot. I just found it a little more boring than the rest of them. Yeah. But it looks like Saki gets the next episode, and she's fucking hilarious to me. So it'll be good. <laughs> oh, that'll be really fun. And also, to the see episode title story. is like eighteen fucking words. Oh, long. I can't wait to read that next week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whichever one of us gets excited. to read it, it's gonna be hilarious. We usually make fun of oh, it, but goodness. with this show, this like this is so intentional. We're making fun of <laughs> the episodes with long titles. Yep. Well, okay. One last thing. There's a scene where like the dad is really upset at himself after she dies. Yeah. After Lily dies, and like he scratches like a scar across his face, hmm. and like that's how he got that scar. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. That was kind yeah. of BS because like it, it's almost like he scratched himself and it was immediately a scar. Mm-hmm. Like there wasn't like any blood, and I was like, come on now. <laughs> yeah, that's a little weird. But, <laughs> just a, it's just a little tweak that I was well, like. If it uh, turned into like some weird tick he got because of like the state of mind he is, and I mean, it could have potentially become one. I guess you could eventually. imagine that. Yeah, that is a little yeah. weird. Yeah. Uh-huh. Speaking yeah. of a little weird, I was Leo. gonna say you want to talk about some of the unbelievable <laughs> shit. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! Here we go. Car- Car- Curry Circus. Oh uh, boy. Episode eight. Moments beginning. Moments end. The show opens with like Shiragane and like a beauty slash talent show to get more funds for the circus. <laughs> and then, that then does, and then like at the win- end, the circus does like a little performance because she wins, of course. She just totally blow- wows the judges. They can't believe it. Uh, and then we get to learn about Lise, who is the circus tamer and comes from a family of wild animal tamers. She uh, went with the family and became one herself, but her sister died by one of the tigers and now she doesn't want to do wild an- animals anymore. And interest is interestingly, it's because of a want for revenge. Yeah, like when Usually, she looks you, at like a tiger, she can't yeah keep herself from thinking about her sister's death. Yeah, and like wanting to kill it and not being afraid of it, like you would mm-hmm. usually think. Uh, so she only does like dogs and cats now. And I mean, kudos if you're got cats doing tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then there's like this cute scene between like Vilma and Shiragane where uh, Vilma gets like Shiragane to basically confess that she had fallen in love with Narumi by the end and that she mostly treated him like a piece of shit. And she tears up because she still believes, you know, he's dead at this point and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I want to mention, you know, Vilma show up last episode and this episode they got her in a bikini right away. <laughs> I did see that. Yep. <laughs> I noticed that. I was like, oh, of course. <laughs> mm. So, okay. For this next part, you have to believe metal <laughs> detectors were never invented in this <laughs> So dumb. Oh, man. <laughs> there is, this whole scene is just chaos. Yes. There's more metal inside the plane than the fucking plane is made of. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Uh, so, the roomy guy and Lucille are on an airplane on their way to China, but a bunch of automata that explode when pierced or on board so that's kind of new uh they attack narumi who like cuts one and explodes like a hole into the side of the plane so they're like shit we can't cut and pierce them anymore and then there's kind of one guy he's kind of running the whole thing and he challenges narumi to, to defeat nine of his colleagues by only using his fists <laughs> uh 
And then, like, he grabs these two children, and he's like, I will break these children's fingers every time you get hit during this fight. <laughs> I'm just like, Jesus Christ. But, I mean, I'm not, it's not too inspecting from the show. Mm-hmm. But then, like, Guy convinces him to break his fingers instead since he has used Olympia to kill countless of his kinds. And he's like, oh, that is a better idea. Mm-hmm. And also, like, Guy doesn't feel any pain. Like, that, these people, Dwight here, they call themselves the Shirogane. So that makes me wonder what they're going to do with Shirogane. I mean, that's... <laughs> This names are being used a lot. I mean, besides what they've already done to poor Shirogane, <laughs> I mean, she's pretty much been used as a porcupine now. Yeah, she like was a, a pincushion. Like pin pin cushion. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, we also find out that, like, all these people, they have some type of weird. Also, do they not feel pain, but they also have weird healing abilities. Yeah. But we'll get more to that. Uh, so like I said, a guy doesn't feel pain, so he doesn't bother him that his fingers are getting broken. And they break all of them except for like three by the time it's all over. Yeah. Uh, but not, Narumi like beats all of them. And even like the head guy who he stabs with this new blade of St. George that looks a lot like God of War's blade on a chain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then like guy, even with his fingers broken except for three, he so the one guy gets uh, stabbed through, so he's going to explode. So he uses Olympia and his own body to like encase him and contain the blast. So the people in this world can just take a hell of a beating. Yeah. It's, I mean, like we knew Shiragana could, but the, the, the explosion was just like, really at this point? Yeah. Oh my God. So yes. Yeah, speaking of taking a hell of a beating, one Automata has taken Lucille's hand, has staked Lucille's hands to the back of a seat. Uh, but that doesn't stop her from getting to the cockpit and taking it back over from the Automata that's taking it over. Uh, but then suddenly the plane is like surrounded by insect automata that are like taking out the engines that you laughed when I did air quotes for insect. Automata. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm not the only one. Uh, but then like guy equips Olympia with a new dress that allows her to like fly. They go outside and it's got like four chain guns on it. And he's kicking ass. And then like the leader, he tricks the leader one and getting close enough. So I grab him Yeah, and then shoots the shit out of him. But then like, he's going to like, kamikaze himself into the plane but then guy like grabs a hold of him and takes him far away from the plane and you just see an explosion so and as we like to say uh no body no death <laughs> i also couldn't take this seriously because like the insect guy and one of like the villain guys earlier talked in these super high voices like i'm gonna get you <laughs> it's like so ridiculous yeah i know and it, like that's the well, whole fucking episode you is know that what way. it makes yeah. me think of like horror shows where the puppets have the high-pitched voices and uh, these guys I are suppose. basically puppets also <laughs> yeah. that's what it kind of made me think of so i still saw it kind of like supposed to be scary in the moment it was uh, funny though <laughs> yeah it's just so, dumb <laughs> So the plane eventually <laughs> the plane oh, eventually crash lands in front of t- take a guess. Oh, it, oh, it oh, won't be somewhere convenient, will it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only the oh, most but, convenient. But also not convenient because oh they don't see him even though he fucking grabs them and <laughs> saves them. What bullshit. So the plane what of utter course, bullshit crash lands in front of the circus and like everybody's running out to investigate and like an automatic goes after a monster and like Shirogane jumps in front of it. And apparently Shirogane blood is bad for Automata because like hmm. Yeah, he goes, oh, no, not Shiragane blood. Like, uh, it's poison for him, I guess. Yeah, that was interesting. Maybe, maybe he's going to explode. Maybe that's why uh, Narumi can kill them or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then, like, Narumi jumps in and saves them both. But the two can't see who it is because of, like, all the dust. But this is Shiragane's second time but seeing his outline defies, in the dust. like, fucking <laughs> defies all logic yeah, that they the, can't the, see the him. One little part I did like was that, like, he pats Masaru on the head. And Masaru yeah. immediately recognizes yeah, the feel, his hand. Like, they, yeah. So I understand. So they, at the very end, like they know, they think it's him, right? Like they, they as he's running away, they're like, Narami? But yeah, they're both like, what the fuck? Is I that- <laughs> understand why he doesn't know because remember, he has uh, amnesia, basically. Right. So he wouldn't recognize yeah, yeah, yeah. Conveniently. Them. Yeah. He has anime sickness. <laughs> Uh, did you mention, Leo, that like in the middle of all that chaos on the plane, like 
those freaking puppets had like chainsaws everywhere and that was well that's why we were complaining about the metal detectors it was so ridiculous and they like they they were completely made out of metal yeah they're all metal but like the chainsaws in particular the action scene was ridiculous (laughs) the the action scenes in this were just like so overwhelming i was just watching it like am i supposed to believe any of this is actually happening i'm so confused yeah like i was crossing my fingers so many questions yeah, I was crossing my fingers at the end of this episode that this was just like kind of like a dumb episode and not a sign of things to come because like there was so much insanely stupid stuff that happened in this one episode. And I was like, <laughs> all right, please, let's just calm down here. <laughs> let's get back to the cool also, storytelling. Like, I thought it was weird how many times Narumi mentions how much he hates a guy in this episode. Yeah. It's like I don't remember him saying Anything about hating guy before? Like, no, and all of a sudden he's like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I'm like, all right, we get it. You hate him. (laughs) Like, you've said it like 50 times this episode. No, the episode before this, yeah, no, he talked about how much he hated guy and like why. I remember that pretty clearly. Did he? Clearly. Yeah, he did. I I guess I wasn't paying attention last episode because there was too much epic stuff happening last episode. (laughs) Yeah. This episode, like, he just emphasizes it so many times. Like, you only need to say it, like, once or twice. That's true. You also only need yeah. one or two insects to take down but a plane. But the guy that this episode did like a couple like redeeming things, like saving the kids from getting their fingers broken. Yeah. So the the show was definitely playing yeah. on that. God, his fingers were going in all different directions. It was ugh, not fun. Yeah, that was that that scene where he's like posed and like all of his fingers are all fucked up and he's got like the <laughs> puppet strings like yeah. on the three fingers. That I was like, damn, dude. All right. <laughs> that's that's a scene that won't haunt my nightmares or anything. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> oh boy. All right, Re- Leo, are you ready to be my flower uh, guru for this next show? Yeah, hi. I'm excited. I had nothing to say about this show, so I had to look up hydrangeas. So three three separate times meeting. in this episode, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Leo and be like, Leo, <laughs> what did this mean? So uh, yeah, we got nice. blo- bloom into you. Uh, episode eight, intersection, and then reined in. So first half of this episode uh, starts off with Sayaka, who is at the train station waiting to meet up with Toko when her ex-girlfriend from middle school bumps into her randomly. And apparently her senpai has been wanting to apologize to her because she believes that confessing to Say- Sayaka might have been what made her attracted to other girls. And, and if she's still attracted to other girls, she's really sorry for what she did to her. <laughs> but oh God. if Sayaka has been go- has gone it's back so to insulting. being... It's very insulting. And she's like, oh, but if you've gone back to being an ordinary, normal girl, then there's no problem. And so Sayaka, you see her like hand twitch. She's like, oh, I want to slap this bitch so bad. Um, oh, she gets her <laughs> with a sick, sick burn. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, you know, so she like the girl's not aware that she's burning her, but this whole time she is. She's basically like, you know, I'm actually surprised that I ever fell for you. And I think the girl takes it as like, I'm surprised I ever fell for a, a girl. But Sayaka's like, no, you're such a bitch. I'm surprised I ever even thought you were nice. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> And then she's like, but I am somewhat grateful because she sees like Toko arriving and then Sayaka just like runs up, up to her, holds onto her arm, like glomps onto her and she like looks back at her senpai, smiles at her and is like, farewell. And she, her senpai <laughs> just like stunned, like doesn't know what to make of this at all. I was just like, <laughs> that was pretty great. Yeah, that was a good burn. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, that Perfect was a timing. good burn. So uh, as they walk away, Toko asks Sayaka, like, what was that all about? And, like, Sayaka's still walking arm in arm linked with her. And Sayaka's like, oh, uh, I just got wrapped up in the moment. She lets go. And then, like, Toko, like, grabs her hand back. And, she, and like, Sayaka's like, what's up? And she's like, well, this is just payback. And so Toko asks Sayaka, like, what color hydrangeas do you like? And you like they point out this like nearby bush, and for Sayaka, her specific hydrangea bush has blue and white flowers on it. So Leo, what does yeah, that so, mean? Okay, we'll get to the blue and the white just in a second. But the whole hydrangea is, according to a Japanese legend, the hydrangea became associated with heartfelt emotions, uh, gratitude for understanding, and apology after a Japanese emperor gave them to the family of the girl he loved to make up for neglecting her in favor of business and show how much he cared about her. 
Uh, pink hydrangeas are special, but we'll come back to those. But you mm-hmm. said the blue and the white ones. So, so blue and white ones for Sayaka. Yes. yes. Blue symbolizes frigidity and apology. So you're like regret, forgiveness, turning down a romantic, romantic proposal. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. White hydrangea sim- symbolizes boasting or bragging, which is in also oh. purity and innocence. So yeah. she did... All of those things. All these just now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That totally makes sense. Yeah. That does make sense. Yeah. So, so it, it's kind of cool because like, there not there like a whole language of flowers and stuff yeah, like that absolutely. out there? Especially oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially in Japan. There yeah, there is. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. We'll, we'll have more hydrangea moments. Uh, let's see. So in the second half of the episode, it's a very rainy day at school. School has just ended. Uh, and Yu's trying to figure out a way to get home with like somebody else's umbrella because she doesn't have hers. Um, so she's with her friend Akari, and she's gonna like walk home with her. But and Akari sees this uh, senpai boy, like blonde kid, who she's clearly into. And Yu recognizes this, and she's like, "All right, all right, this is the perfect opportunity for you. Like, go, go after him." Uh, and Akari's like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, she like pushes her. And so she runs up to this guy and offers him like her umbrella and he accepts and it's very cute. But meanwhile, you is screwed because she's lost her umbrella friend. So she has to figure mm-hmm. out some other way to get home. Yep. So she thinks about calling Toko, but kind of like decides against it. I'm not exactly sure why. I guess she just doesn't want to impose or she just feels awkward. And she instead first calls her sister, but her sister's boyfriend, or I don't remember if it's his, her fiance or not, her, uh, his name is Hiro, answers. And Yu decides, like, uh, I guess I won't interrupt your date and make you come pick me up or anything. Uh, so she, like, tells him, like, oh, I, I see another friend. She kind of flies and gets off the phone. And but it's funny because they <laughs> accurately predict you don't have your umbrella, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they know. And so, like, Yu's sister, Ray tells Hiro, like, Yu is usually, like, really reluctant to commit to things at the start. And she's, like, kind of hoping that one of her friends will be able to pull her through this, like, stuff. Like, just through this, like, time of her life. So that's interesting. And so Yu is about to give up and just walk home in the rain. <laughs> she can't find anybody. And at this moment, Toko shows up with an umbrella. And, like, she had apparently called you, but Yu's phone was, like, busy tone because she was calling her sister. And they walk home together. And Toko kind of reminisces because they're walking home on the same route that she and her older sister used to take, like, way back when in, like, elementary school, basically. Because she used to live closer to this school before she moved away and went to middle school. And she tells you, like, you're not, like, you're like the only person I could talk about my childhood with. Uh, and then they get into this extremely cliche fight about who should hold the umbrella. Like, Toka's like, I'm taller, so I should, it's easier for me to hold it. And Yu's like, but I'm the Kohai, so I should hold it for my senpai. And it's, you know, it's really dumb. They eventually yeah. just laugh at each other because they're being dumb and they look stupid. And they decide to both hold it with one hand each. Um so you then has them stop under an awning at one point because like Toko has gotten wet and she has this dry towel in her bag that she was going to use for like running practice. But that got rained out. So she like wraps it around Toko's hair and starts like pampering her. Basically, Toko says like little sisters are supposed to be good at. Um, but she wonders if like she's taking advantage of you. So, like she said, she tells this to her out loud, like. And, like, she doesn't want to feel like she's forcing you to do any of this. And, like, you thinks to herself that uh, Toko even thinking of her and asking her this question is, like, more pampering that she, than she's even doing. Just drying Toko's hair. And tells her, like, I'm really happy that Dude, that saved. was weird how much what? she was just, like, uh, like uh, the way she was just drying her hair for, like, forever it felt like <laughs> it was very yeah. intimate and romantic for sure like i don't know if you meant it to come off that way but like i felt it there was some electricity there going on like yeah it was it was but like i guess it's like a senpai kohai type of thing like little sister pampering older sister type thing but there's more to it for sure and isn't that yeah that's specifically what they said so <laughs> yeah and when like it's you, funny when you says um like, I was really happy when you saved me earlier today. Like, Toko's, like, really happy. Like, what does that mean? Does that, does that mean something more? And so the scene also, all, all this time, is constantly cutting away to a nearby hydrangea bush. And at the end of the scene, um, you asks Toko, like, what 
hydrangeas do you like? And we're shown like blue and purple and pink hydrangeas for Toko. So what do those mean? So that, that yeah, okay. So back to the blue where we know it was like frigidity and apology. So I'm not sure. Well, what's the apology here? What's the forgiveness? A regret, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure about well, why the blue it, or there. It also says yeah. turning down a remote romantic proposal. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. So, okay. Purple, the purple though. One, yeah. Symbol desires a, a, a desire to deeply understand someone. So that one's completely obvious. That is obviously the, makes the makes pink sense. Pink ones are they're they're kind of I guess extra special in the hydrangeas because they're associated with genuine emotion because their shape resembles a beating heart mm. and they mm. symbolize heartfelt emotion love romance marriage stuff like that yeah so also i feel like i i definitely skipped over like a whole paragraph in my synopsis didn't i because like there's this there's this whole scene earlier in the episode where you hangs out with sayaka this is like in the first half of the episode i don't know how Damn. i skipped this they go to like McDonald's, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, because I was Damn like, there's a third hydrangea. I hope you wouldn't thing. notice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. We're, I'm almost done. So, like, they go to this McDonald's, which is called like Y Donald's, and it has like triple arches, and it was really weird. Um, well, it, they blocked out a whole bunch well, of names with like sued. street signs and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. They're like, how can we do this while making it obvious while not getting sued? <laughs> yeah. And they both kind of just prod each other because, like, you ask Sayako, like, do you like like toko and sayaka's like oh yeah just like as a friend and then shoots the question right back at you and you's like oh of course i like her as a senpai they both kind of mm. eye each other and they're like i see well, you and they're like because what <laughs> else could she possibly yeah, well, be yeah, to either of us and i'm just like uh <laughs> this is getting awkward so um, um but yeah there's a so you in this part ask sayaka like what color of hydrangeas do you like and for you or sorry, Sayaka asked you, my bad. So for you, the ones we see are pink and white flowers. Leo, what does that mean? <laughs> so the pink <laughs> ones we knew were the heartfelt emotions, mm-hmm. love, romance, whatnot. And the white ones are boasting or bragging. Or purity and innocence. Yeah. Or, so, yes, or purity and innocence. So yeah, that's it's interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I think all the hydrangea imagery makes sense for each of the individual characters. It was pretty cool. Uh, little like motif they had going on but yeah, yeah. and just as a side note there is a, a flower of course for uh, lesbians or yuri which is lily the which lily is flower, yeah yeah which, which i think well, i knew you knew you after a while you pick up if you've seen a couple uh lesbian anime yeah. but uh it, it, its term is with slender stems and large flowers yuri the japanese name for lily mm-hmm. is said to have come from the verb yuru meaning to sway as lily does naturally in the breeze Makes sense. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Very poetic. Uh, yeah, and this episode just <laughs> yeah. ends with... Uh, it's called Language of the Flowers. Well, yes, you don't very think it's poetic. going to be poetic. <laughs> <laughs> so this episode ends with uh, you and Sayaka, who had been having trouble with their, like, baton passing for the, the upcoming, like, culture festival race. Uh, ends with them finally figuring out their baton pass. So good for them. Good job. <laughs> so... I kind of took this whole episode as the idea, like, this, they, they're all in a holding pattern, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they're waiting for Toko to, like, stop putting on an act, but they're not really sure what will happen after that. And Toko, like, doesn't want to stop putting on an act. Yeah. Um, they're all just kind of frozen in place with this, like, Catch-22, where Toko's like, I don't want, you know, you to love me. I just want to love you. And... I don't really want anything real, but I, I do want this. And, like, it's all very complicated. But I do think, like, eventually something will happen, and then it'll be, like, like it goes down fast, you know? Like, things change really quickly once things start moving. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. I've heard tell that episode nine is when things happen. So that'll be interesting to talk about next week. I don't know what mm. happens. Ooh. I just know that people have been going nuts. So, Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about that. I wonder if there'll be more uh, symbolism because I find that interesting more than 
what everything else that's happening in the show. I think, yeah, it's one of the more interesting <laughs> but, parts of the show is like the, the cinematography symbolism and then just like the active like flower symbolism that's going on too. Oh man, I need to look up what black mold means in <laughs> Japanese. Thing. Oh God. God. Damn it. Well, with that, uh, clearly we're done here. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> thanks Kat for like lending your voice as little as is left of it to this podcast. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Anytime. And so remember to like, follow, and subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on new podcasts and videos. Uh, you can also find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter at Nerdum and Other for updates as well, or on Discord at the link in the description of the YouTube video or the podcast feed. And with that, we will see you next time. <laughs>